So today I'd like to talk about uh, how we find disease-causing mutations. This is going to rely on a computational problem known as read mapping. Um, and to get to that, I, I'd like to first talk about uh, the, the simple fact that the cost of sequencing a genome has decreased exponentially over the past decade. Um, according to NIH, in 2001, it cost about $100 million to sequence a human genome. In 2013, that's well below $10,000, and there's a hope that uh, we'll soon see the $1,000 genome. As genome sequencing has gotten cheaper, biologists have moved from wanting to answer large-scale questions about species comparison using genomes towards uh, using personal genomes to answer biological questions. So we moved from a generic average case human being to specific humans, me, Pavel, and Sean, and we want to say what is it that makes us unique as humans uh, individually. So if we look at our genomes, they're largely similar, right? Um, we only have small variations for the most part, and the most common type of mutation causing these variations is a single nucleotide variation. So we may see a substitution in the same position, we might see a C, an A, or a T, okay? So the question then would be why do we care about this? And there's many different reasons why we want to do personal genomics. Probably the most popular one are, um, is that they can help us with identifying the basis of genetic diseases. Uh, Sean and Pavel mentioned in the assembly talk that uh, in 2010, uh, this child, Nicholas Volker, became the first human being to have his uh, life saved because of genome sequencing. They found a, uh, they were able to use gene therapy after having performed a number of unsuccessful surgeries. And so the hope is that this is going to be the future of medicine, that we'll be able to identify uh, genetic issues using an individual genome and use these to design uh, effective treatments. Again, as the cost of sequencing a genome has decreased, we're now seeing large-scale projects to sequence huge numbers of genomes. So in the UK, there's a personal genome project with a goal that's recently launched with a goal of uh, sequencing 100,000 human genomes. Of course, it's not a central focus of what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about a computational problem today. But when we start uh, talking about a huge number of genomes like this, there are a number of ethical issues. So for example, what if you had your genome sequenced and you found out that you had a high probability of getting some um, genetic disorder later in life? Uh, would your employer be able to fire you because of that, because they wouldn't want to keep you around? Uh, and in the U.S., we actually have had uh, Congress pass uh, the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, which said that employers are not able to do this, right? If they find out genetic information, they're not able to prevent you from getting health insurance or fire you bef without a uh, good reason. So we want to move, again, as I said, towards a computational problem. And the computational problem is going to work as follows. Once we've sequenced a human genome, we can now have a reference genome. So we have a genome in a database that we can compare against um, since we know that all human genomes are very similar. So our question is, how is it that we can assemble individual genomes now efficiently using the reference genome information that we already have. The question would be then, why don't we use assembly, right? We've learned a lot about algorithms in this course. We have a huge arsenal of different methods that we can use to answer questions in bioinformatics. So maybe the most obvious um, solution that we would do would be to say, let's just sequence, um, let's assemble the individual genome from scratch. And then once we have assembled that using the assembly methods that we already know, we can compare it against the reference genome and identify places where the variants occur. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable way of looking at the problem, but uh, traditionally constructing a de Bruijn graph or to, to assemble a genome from scratch is something that takes a lot of memory. Um, our hope is that we can use the information that's stored in the reference genome. If we have, uh, if each individual shares 99, has 99 percent similarity with the reference genome, then we shouldn't need to start from scratch. We should be able to use the information that's in that reference to help us assemble each new individual genome. So our end hope would be maybe you could go into a clinic and have your uh, genome sequenced in 10 minutes using the reference that it would collect and map your reads. Now what do I mean by mapping reads? Um, by read mapping we mean that we want to determine where each read, so each read that's generated by the sequencing machine, has high similarity to the reference genome. Okay, so rather than assembling from scratch, 
We're going to take each of your sequencing reads, and we're going to say, where is this read most similar to the reference genome, and does, is there any variation there? So we might, say, we might see a perfect substring match here. We might see a substitution here, and we may see a deletion there. Um, we're going to focus on a simpler question, though, which is going to help us generalize the problem, which is, where is it that the sequencing reads from your genome, uh, where is it that they match the reference genome exactly? If we can answer this question, then maybe we can generalize it. Okay? And so if we're given a single read, uh, then this corresponds to a problem that we've already seen back at the start of the class, which was the pattern matching problem for a single pattern. So you're given a string pattern that represents a read and then a larger string genome. And you want to figure out wh which positions that pattern matches the genome as a substring. So now all, we, all we're doing then is generalizing this to multiple reads or multiple patterns. We're finding, given a collection of patterns, um, where is it that those patterns match exactly in the larger genome? We, you probably implemented a brute force approach to the pattern matching problem in chapter one if you solved the code challenge there. And probably the way that you did it was to slide the pattern down the genome. And so if you had a pattern nana and you were looking at the genome Panama bananas, now we're going to use words or things that are close to words. So we're going to use like the structure of English so that I don't have to say A C G T T G G G because this is a string problem, okay? So we're going to assume that our genome is Panama bananas and this is an example that we'll come back to. And so say that we have this hypothetical read nana. If we want to find exact matches, then we simply slide it down. We see in the first position P and N don't match, so we slide it down and N don't match. And then in the third position, we see a match of n. Okay? And so we say, well, let's move to the second position. We see two matches. The third position, we don't match. And so we can slide the, the pattern down to the next position. No match, no match, no match, no match. And then we finally reach an n again. And we see that there is a pattern match there. And then we're at the end of the string. So uh, this seems like a perfectly reasonable approach. We take each pattern and we just slide it down the genome and find out where the pattern matches. So I think maybe we can call it a day early today, uh, or at least on this problem, maybe we can start going ahead and generalizing from the exact pattern matching problem. But I think we've got a perfectly reasonable way of solving the multiple pattern matching problem.